Jalaluddin Rumi, like the Sufis in general, affirms there are many paths to God. We will discuss Rumi's view and see Rumi's standpoints on it. In Fihimafi, Rumi tells that one day he was speaking in the midst of Muslims and unbelievers. In the middle of Rumi's talk, they began to weep with emotion and show signs of ecstasy. Someone asked, what can they understand? What do they know? Only one Muslim in a thousand understands this kind of talk. What could an unbeliever understand that would cause them to weep? Rumi replied, it isn't necessary for them to understand the inner meaning of what we say. The vessel of this meaning is the words themselves, and this they to recognize. After all, everyone knows of the oneness of God, creator and provider, the source of all life, where all things return. When anyone hears these words, which are a description and expression of God, a universal emotion and inner feeling stirs them, since out of these words comes a sense of their beloved and their quest. The ways may vary, but the goal is one. Don't you see that there are many roads to the Kaaba? For some, the route is from Ram, for some from Syria, others come from Persia or China, or by sea from India and Yemen. So if you consider the routes, they are beyond counting, with infinite differences. But when you consider the goal, they are all in accord with one desire. The hearts of all are upon the Kaaba. The hearts are one in their longing and love for the Kaaba. And in that, there is no room for separation. The term Kaaba is certainly an illustration to Rumi's audience that there are indeed many roads to Kaaba. But the term doesn't only represent Muslims. Kaaba as a symbol of God's house becomes Rumi's metaphor to emphasize that all roads taken to Kaaba will lead everyone to meet God. Rumi also gives us an analogy that a king ordered the people to pitch a tent. People started arguing. One said, if I don't make the tent ropes, how will the tent stand up? Another said, if I don't make the pegs, where will they tie the ropes? Rumi explains, still, everybody knows these people are servants of the king. If the weavers gave up weaving and sought to be vizier's, the whole world would be naked and bare. So they were given a joy for their craft. They are content with weaving. Therefore, people were created to keep the word of foam in order. The word of foam is arranged in such a way by the ocean. One has to walk the path of God according to the craft he can, and so do others, with the result that the word of foam remains in line with the ocean. According to Rumi, inwardly in the depth of the human heart, all humans, irrespective of unbelievers, believers, polytheists, Muslims, seek, worship, and love God. Such inner belief in Rumi's view cannot be labeled or judged as believer or unbeliever. In Rumi's own words, Within the heart it has no name, but when the water of inner truth flows out of the heart towards the sluice of the tongue and takes form, it acquires shape and expression. There it is given the name of invitality or faith, good or evil. For Rumi, the inner world of humans is very subtle and cannot be judged. There is no indication that can show that a person is an infidel or unbeliever as far as the inner world is hidden. It has neither a name nor a form. However, when humans express their inner thing, there is an assessment of whether those expressions indicate belief or disbelief. Rumi said, when believers and infidels sit together and say nothing, they are one and the same. There is no conflict of belief. The heart is a free word. Beliefs are subtle things that cannot be judged. People can judge by outward expression only. God is the fashion of our secret hearts. Rumi would actually remind that the disputes that occur between or amongst humans, especially regarding religion, are only in the aspects of expression, of form, of symbol, or on the exoteric level, but on the inner level of everyone, what is hidden is the same desire and an unavoidable goal. As we pointed out earlier, just because of different languages, people can fight and argue. Once again, Rumi assures us that everyone has the right to address his lord in their own language because the idiom of Hindustan is excellent for Hindus. The idiom of sin is excellent for the people of sin. I look not at tongue and speech, I look at the spirit and the inward feeling. It was narrated by Rumi that Prophet Moses rebuked one of his followers who prayed, 
Where thou that I may serve thee and sew thy shoes and comb thy hair that I may wash thy clothes and kill thy lies and bring milk to thee, O worshipful one, that I may kiss thy little hand and rub thy little feet and sweep thy little room at bedtime. Because according to Moses, it was as if the man were lightning God to a human, Moses rebuked harshly. In God's view, instead of Moses' rebuke being justified, Moses was rebuked by God. You have parted my servant from me, where you sent as a prophet to unite or to sever. I have bestowed on everyone a particular mood of worship. I have given everyone a peculiar form of expression. I look not at tongue and speech, I look at the spirit and the inward feeling. The story expressly shows that each person has a unique way which is his own way to get closer to God. Rumi records the prophets and messengers sent by God to different places as the path to God. The messages they carried, even though they were aimed at specific community or people, had the same substance and were universal. It is said in the Quran, for every community there is a messenger, and the essence of the messages is the same. Verily there is no God but I, so worship me. Although in different languages, and we have sent no messenger save in the language of his people. The message of each religion is based on and underpinned by the same pillar, even though they seem unique and different from one another. In this respect, Rumi emphasizes that every prophet and every saint have different paths, religious doctrines and rites, but all of them lead to God. Using an inner point of view, Rumi sees this diverse word as mere colors and he reminds people not to forget who the real painter is. It is undeniable that Sufis, Gnostics or mystics have always echoed the same idea of the unity of the many. Rumi himself also maintains it, quotes every line of poetry the saints and prophets bring forth, Every tradition, every verse they write is like a witness bearing testimony. They bear witness to every situation according to the nature of the situation. The inner form of their testimony is always the same. It is the outer meaning that differs. Very beautifully, Rumi also illustrates that in such a vast world, it is impossible for there to be only one ladder for everyone to climb. To reach the sky, everyone takes a different ladder. Quote, there are many different ladders in every nation. Because of that, there are many different skies too for travelers. Many and diverse spiritual ladders and paths are none other than God himself. The spiritual ladders are provided by God. Inevitably, how can humans build their own ladder? And the various ladders are certainly under God's control. And if God doesn't allow them, he certainly only provides one ladder and destroys the others. Each believer simply responds his call and climbs his ladder God has provided. Therefore, for Rumi, many different roads have become easy to follow. Everyone's religion has become to him as dear as life. If God's main religion easy was the right road, Every Jew and Zoroastrian would have knowledge of him. One thinks that he has been walking on the right belief, even though another person in another religion thinks that it is wrong. One should never be able to judge other people's beliefs, let alone blame the system of belief of other religions from the point of view of his own religion. According to me, those who walk both on the guided path and the straight path all lead to him. Although Rumi's assertion about the diversity of paths to God seem obvious, Rumi still insists that the only path that leads to the true happiness is the one laid out by Muhammad. To Rumi, the Prophet Muhammad was cypress of the garden of prophethood, springtime of Gnosis, rosebud of the meadow of the divine law and lofty nightingale. Rumi also criticizes the pagans and the infidels who, according to him, will have bad luck. By quoting the Prophet's statement, Rumi asserts, Haven't you realized the threats which you have made might come true, and punishment will be visited upon the unbelievers as you have never imagined? Then why do you not take precautions and seek after us? In this regard, Rumi takes a firm standpoint to establish that the right path is the one laid out by the Prophet Muhammad. Rumi also warns the Magi and Zoroastrians. 
anyone to whom fire is a refuge and support becomes both a Magian and a Zoroastrian. Everything except God is vain. Verily, the grace of God is a cloud pouring abundantly and continually. Rumi also criticizes the Jewish and Christian theological systems. In Fihi Manfihi and Mathnavi, Rumi points out a lot of errors in theological systems in religions other than Islam. According to Anna Mary Schimmel, although Rumi loved Jesus and Mary very much, he still criticized the customs of Christians. In Schimmel's words, despite his devotion to Jesus and Mary, Rumi was critical of many Christian customs and of the Christian theological position. Here Rumi stands as a theologian who clearly sees that Islam is the true road and the path of happiness that can lead its adherents to be full of happiness. However, Rumi as a Sufi who walks on the path of love because Islam as a religion full of grace, gentleness, and beauty. The perfection of Islam for Rumi lies precisely in its character which requires love to permeate the whole of human life wherever they are, regardless of their religions. Rumi never teaches to hate other people outside of Islam. He states, don't reject the disbeliever because perhaps he will die as a Muslim. What knowledge do you have of the end of his life that you turn your face away from him? It is also narrated that a Christian craftsman was building a fireplace in Rumi's house. Rumi's friends wanted to tease the craftsman and they said, Why don't you become Muslim? Islam is the best of religions. He replied, For 50 years I have been in Jesus' religion. If I abandon my religion, now I am fearful and I would be ashamed in front of him. Upon hearing this, Rumi said, The essence of faith is fear. Whoever fears God, even if that person is a Christian, he is a man of God. Now we can conclude two points. First, as a Muslim, Rumi criticizes the teachings of other religions, which in Rumi's I have deviated and have no longer been in accordance with the ideal religion that should be. Rumi here stands as a Sufi who adheres to Islamic doctrine by which he sees deviations in other religions. Therefore, he concludes that the most perfect path to take is the one laid out by the Prophet Muhammad. Second, as a lover, Rumi says that this word is always being moved by love and also moves for the sake of love. As he reminds, know that the waves of love make the cosmos go round. Were it not for love, the cosmos would freeze and go frowned. By this view, Rumi considers that there is nothing that doesn't become a wave of love itself, which is why there is nothing that doesn't become a lover. Therefore, Rumi asserts that every believer has his own ladder and the journey is moved for the sake of love. Since from this perspective, all religions and beliefs are the waves of love that move for the sake of love. Quote, O love who has a thousand names and a cup of sweet wine, O thou who bestowest a thousand skills, O formless one with a thousand forms, O form giver to the Turk, Greek, and Ethiopian, 